Pretty good. Hello, Devonch. Hi, sir. How are you? All right. We're still waiting for Ojwa. I don't know if he's uh, how close he is to being here. Anyone have any news they'd like to share or uh, or waiting? Any items they'd like to bring up? Is. Okay, I think Ujwal's here actually. So, oh, hi, am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. So, uh, looks like you're ready to present. So, if no one is uh, has any news to report, Ujwal is uh, going to present his talk today on uh, DNA fingerprinting. Just, I think that's the topic. Um, so, welcome to the meeting. And, uh, Ujwal, can you share your screen? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. Vinay says that is a great topic. Well, so, hello, hi everyone. So, today I am going to discuss about like what DNA fingerprinting is and what are the some major techniques that are being used in DNA fingerprinting and some applications of DNA fingerprinting to get a overbroad idea about what this thing is and why it is so useful in bio biology. So, <clears throat> First of all, let us discuss some basics and fundamentals about DNA fingerprinting. So DNA fingerprinting is one of the greatest identification systems that have been developed to recognize an individual or a living organism. Every living creature is genetically different in its own way, except for the identical twins, triplets, etc. DNA is comparable to the serial number of living things. Each individual contains unique sequence that is specific to that one organism. So like there are many traditional fingerprinting methods that can be surgically altered and self mutilated. For example, like say, simple fingerprints can be mutilated because of injury or something like that. So unlike traditional fingerprints, which can be surgically altered, the DNA sequence cannot be easily changed once the material is left at the, uh, maybe we can say like in the crime scenes, or uh, it can be used in effectively in forensics probability of finding an exact match. So this method of identification is useful like many applications like forensics, paternity testing, molecular archaeology mm, uh, to, to detect and arrest of criminals etc. So we are going to discuss all this. So first of all, let us see like a very brief introduction about what DNA is. So DNA is known as di dioxyribonucleic acid, contains a specific sequence of bases called nucleotides, which contains the information of all characteristics of the living organism. This information was inherited through the DNA of their parents. DNA found in most in almost every cell of the living organism. DNA present the uh, DNA is just like uh, we can say an uh, instruction book for making living organism. Four nucleotides that constitute DNA, as you all know, are 
एडेनी थाइमी क्वेनी एंड साइटोसिन तो मॉलिकुलर स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ डीएनए कैन बी इमेजिन एज जिपर विच टू रिप्रेजेंटिंग वन ऑफ द फोर लेटर्स ए जी ए सी जी टी विद अपोजिट टी फॉर्मिंग द टू पेयर्स फॉर एग्जाम्पल ए टी एंड जी सी दीज आर दर्स विच आर फॉर्म तो हाफ इन द डीएनए एप्लीकेशन द हाफ ऑफ द क्रोमोजोम्स ऑफ द इंडिविजुअल कम्स फ्रॉम द मदर एंड अदर हाफ फ्रॉम फादर क्रोमोजोम्स आर फाउंड इन न्यूक्लियस कंटिन्यूस स्टैंड ऑफ डीएनए डीएनए मॉलिक्यूल इज ट्रेस्टेड इन टू इट सेल्फ एंड सुपर कॉइल मॉलिक्यूल is enclosed in proteins which help to maintain its shapes uh, these chromosomes are basically used to carry the genes that make each individual so these are some basics uh, so basically what dna fingerprinting is so and as i already discussed like unless they are identical twins every individual has a unique dna DNA fingerprinting, the name used for the unambiguous identifying technique that takes advantage of differences in DNA sequences. The process of DNA fingerprinting begins by isolating DNA from uh, all kind of unwanted materials like blood, semen, hair, root, skin, skeletal remains, etc. So basically, there are major types of fingerprintings are. RFLP, which is also known as restricted segment length polymorphism, VNTR, STR, and PCR, which we are going to discuss in following slides. So RFLP analysis. Now, as we have the understanding about like what DNA is, like we can discuss about DNA fingerprint. So they are I have explained like three types of. Major types of DNA fingerprinting methods that are RFLP, VNTRs, STRs, and PCRs. So RFLP are commonly known for the first type of DNA fingerprinting that come into the scene uh, in around late eighties, eighties eighty five. RFLP focuses on size difference of certain genetic locations. The first step in creating an RFLP fingerprint is obtaining and isolating a DNA. DNA can be obtained from almost any of the cell or tissue in the human body. You do not need a large amount of tissue. Uh, am I am I audible, right? Yes. I can hear you. So okay, so we are talk, we are talking about the first step in the creating RFLP fingerprinting is obtaining and isolating the DNA. This DNA can be obtained from almost any cell or tissue of the human body. We do not need a large amount of tissue or blood to provide enough DNA for analysis. DNA is then extracted from the blood or the tissue sample. From here, we carry out the second step in the process, which is cutting, sizing, and sorting the DNA samples. DNA is cut using restricted enzymes, which cut the DNA. Stand at a specific places. Restricted enzymes are usually isolated from bacteria that use them to degrade foreign DNA, like viral DNA, etc. These type of restricted restriction enzymes recognizes and cuts a particular DNA sequence. The DNA at this point is cut into various array of pieces, which are sorted accordingly. By size through the process called electrophoresis. So, in this process, the DNA is particle are mixed with the buffer solution and applied to a gel made of seaweed agarose. Each side of the gel is connected to an electrical current. The DNA is negatively charged due to its phosphate growth, so it migrates towards the positive electrode or anode. The smaller pieces of DNA moves faster through the gel than the larger one, so this provides the basis of fragment separation. This technique is the DNA equivalent of screening sand, uh, a progressive finer mesh screen to determine particle sizes. The band pattern that DNA creates in agarose gel is then transferred to the nylon sheets. 
to complete this transfer a liner sheet is placed on the gel and left to soak overnight in the high salt solution after soaking procedure is completed the nylon membrane contains the same pattern of dna as occurred in the original gel that we have used the membrane is now prepared and undergo its probing phase radioactive and fluorescently labeled probes are hydrized onto nylon membrane which bind to specific dna sequences present in the pattern to produce a pattern of bands which create dna fingerprints this process can be performed with several different probes simultaneously to make final product which looks very similar to the barcode uh, we can see in this example like this is one of the example uh, of our rflp auto radiograph so this is how rf lp is done the second most really used procedure comes is vntr variable vntr stands for variable number tantum repeats uh, it represents specific location on the chromosome in which tantum repeats of 90 to 80 or more bases repeats a different number of times between individuals these regions of dna are readily analyzed using the rflp approach and the probe specifies to a vntr locus the fragments are little shorter than rflp but they created through exact same process since rflp and vntr are created in the same fashion they exhibit same overall advantages and disadvantages some advantages of dna fingerprinting are they are more stable reproducible which is a valuable trait to have when you are trying to determine the exact match of the person's dna which must exclude billions and of other people's dna with a certain degree of confidence they are also easy to prevent contamination since dna sample is larger than with other types of dna sample and small amounts of dna contamination does not alter the analysis now if you want to talk about like some disadvantages of rflp and vntr they are very time consuming especially the the hydrization step the probe hydrization step which we have discussed earlier they require a very large amount of dna must be used to obtain adequate samples too many polymorphism may be present a short probe and cost is very high due to labor and time requirements so these are some advantages and disadvantages which i can list uh, of rfp and vntr now we go to the next method which is str and pcr so currently the most popular method of dna fingerprinting are short tandem repeats which is str unlike vntr which analyzes the mini satellites that have repeated the sequences of 9 to 80 base pairs str uses micro satellites which have repeated the sequence of 2 to 5 base pairs introducing the less is more philosophy to the world of dna fingerprinting uh, this is a big step forward in forensic sciences since the length of dna fragment being analyzed is short enough to be amplified by polymerase chain reaction which is pcr so now we are able to analyze very small sample of data that is quicker and easier than previously known method and match it to the person's identity pcr developed in mid again in mid 1980s and used the same some principles that cells use to replicate dna to amplify the specified region which is usually between 150 to 3000 base pairs in length in order to amplify dna sequence a pair of short priming sequences which are complementary to the ends of the targeted sequence a special heat resistance dna polymerase called tuck polymerase a solution of four dna bases are all mixed together in a test tube which contains few copies of targeted dna sequence the dna is then amplified by the repetition of cycle which contains vital three steps as in the figure you can see like this is how the replication is being done 
And in the next slide, you can also see like how this application is basically done. This is the tuck polymerase. This is the nucleotide. Then the vital steps which is include is the solution is heated to 95 degree to unseal the double helix of DNA structure. Uh, double helix is the form where the DNA is in which the DNA is stored, as we have discussed earlier. The solution is cooled to 55 degree to allow the primers to bind to the ends of DNA. As you can see here, template primers. The solution is then reheated to 75 degree, which is optimal temperature for the tuck polymerase to create a new copies of each DNA strand. So, one PCR cycle takes approximately two minutes to complete. This cycle doubles the amount of previous amount of targeted sequence in the test tube, and it only takes about 50 cycles to produce hundreds of thousands of DNA copies. So long as primers are chosen to flank an STR site, the pan amplified will represent the STR locus, and a simple gel or column will determine the band length. Thus, this procedure avoids the lengthy probe of hydrization steps to membrane of RFLP PNTR approaches. So this is one of the advantage over them. STR is currently most popular type of DNA fingerprint as we have stated already. And since the whole PCR process takes only few hours compared to RFLP VNTR probe hydrization and flame exposure which can take several days, STR can use much smaller samples of DNA and can even use partially degraded DNA to create a fingerprint. Thus, the integrity and quality of DNA sample is not as great a factor with STR than the traditional methods of DNA fingerprinting. The current standard forensic protocols analyzes 13 core STR loci, which have been carefully chosen for the uniqueness. Only disadvantage of STR approach is it is sensitive to contamination DNA, contaminating DNA. So usually STR approach is used first, followed by VNTR analysis if contamination is suspected and enough DNA is available. So now let us we can have covered like what are the major techniques of DNA fingerprinting watch are being used currently and now let us see like what are some applications of DNA fingerprinting. DNA fingerprinting is widely used all over the world. They can be used to solve criminal cases, used to conduct paternity tests and even to determine the authenticity of rare sports. Whatever the case it is, it is evident that DNA fingerprinting has revolutionized the way the world identifies biological matches. Uh, we can discuss some examples here. So one of the exam one of the way in which it is used is for the paternity test. Paternity test or another application of DNA fingerprinting that has been incorporated around the world. In paternity test, potential fathers of the child have their DNA analyzed with the child and the mother's DNA in order to see which potential father has the most DNA in common with the child in question. So another application of the DNA fingerprinting which is one of the most recent method is molecular archaeology. This method of archaeology uses DNA to determine the species of an archaeological discovery to trace the bloodline of elements or human remains. Recently, uh, the skeleton of Neolithic man was found in Alps in 1991 and molecular biology was used on that skeleton to find the ancestors of that particular skeleton. So, other examples are specimens from these type of climates are trial in Iceman, which was found in Alps as I have discussed. The mummies in Egypt are found in dry desert. The Iceman was found around 5300 years old and the DNA was extracted from the remains of his gut which found small traces of food that he ate. This was one of the most historical archaeological discoveries in the last century. DNA fingerprinting 
is an important tool for archaeologists to piece together the information that links to past to us today. DNA fingerprintings are also used in the world of sports, as I have mentioned, with sports collectors spending challenging amounts of money to own a piece of sports history. There needed to be a way to validate the authenticity of their memorabilia. This can be treated with the synthetic DNA sphere in which the item is coated with the secret DNA sequence where the original batch of DNA is destroyed. The collectible can then be auctioned off giving the buyer assurance that the product is indeed authentic. This is just another instance that how the DNA fingerprinting is being used in today's world. So this is these are the applications of DNA fingerprinting and how they are used. Uh, I'm particularly like fascinated about like how we are using the finger, DNA fingerprinting to find out about the history of humankind and other animals. So this is one of the major breakthrough which is not there with the, any other sort of identification techniques. In the next talk, I guess I am going, I would like to discuss about DNA forensics and some machine learning applications which are being used uh, and which are helping in DNA fingerprinting. To give an overall view, machine learning is used, is helping the DNA fingerprinting traditional methods as they can find patterns much easier in the smaller and smaller strands of DNA than the traditional humans have to then the traditional tradition then the humans have to do uh, with their eyes then under the microscope so it is a one factor which is where the machine learning is contributing and there are some other factors as well uh, which I would like to discuss in the next I'm already I guess out of time so I will discuss in the next talk so if anybody has any questions Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, uh, Ojwal. So um, we went through a bunch of examples. Uh, I think we talked about something similar. Uh, DNA, they call it, sometimes they call it DNA barcoding. And we talked about this for identifying different cell types. There was a paper... I can't remember right now what the citation is, but we reviewed a paper a while back in, in the group about this where they would take uh, different cell types uh, and then they would look, they would find, they would, I don't know if they like inserted barcodes through some technique or if they identified barcodes, but they were able to trace cells through lineage trees. Do you remember that paper, Dick? Uh, not offhand, no. Okay, yeah, it's, I, I should have uh, brought it to the meeting, but I didn't. Anyways, it, uh, I guess that's another application of it. Um, they also use it in, um, in like biogenetics and, and areas like that where to, you know, use it as a marker for looking at descent of populations and species. So, you know, you can... Uh, look at common descent and look at, you know, you have these, they're basically short repeats of DNA. So you get a sense of like, um, you know, the, the sort of uniqueness of that stretch of DNA. And then they use it to trace a lineage. So it might mutate over time and they can find the common ancestor or just use that as a way to identify common ancestry. So I, I like this, uh, I think that was a pretty interesting presentation as well. So you said that there are some machine learning applications to this, using this technique. Could you share some of those with us just kind of informally? I mean, what are you, what are you thinking in terms of that? Oh, like in, like uh, machine learning is basically helping in this, like, uh, like if we have very small amount of DNAs and we have to replicate them, so, and if had contamination, we have to prefer, refer to uh, RF, I don't exactly, huh, RFLP analysis or something like that, which takes time and it also has human errors. 
So what machine learning is helping with is like we have already trained models on the genomes. Uh, we have to take protein data banks and all these things. So they are helping to see this what are the patterns being emerged in that sample DNA and other suspects DNA, and they are helping to match them uh, with a very small amount of DNA. So this is one of the application of machine learning in that form. Also, like it helps not machine learning helps not based particularly on DNA fingerprinting, but they also helps in recognizing the protein protein structures and to predict the protein structures. Like in medicines, when the medicines are acting on our body, machine learning applications are being developed. Like in Google AI labs and something like that, they are developing the applications so that they can actually predict how this. Particular medicine going to attach with that particular protein or cell. So these are some other applications. And in the archaeology, like the machine learning applications are helping again in pattern matching. So basically, the pattern matching thing which human has to do under microscopes is being replaced by machine learning models. Okay. Uh, what what kinds of algorithms are they using for the machine learning? I mean, you know, what kinds of models are they deep learning or are they sort of uh, discriminant models? What, what are some of the state of the art models? Uh, like, uh, as far as I have researched, like, they have some models which are not deep learning based, they are simply statistical models to uh, find patterns between the each DNS things. And I think that Google AI Lab is working with the deep lab models uh, when the head of Google AI India comes to our college. He told us like they are working on the deep lab model, deep deep lab, uh, deep lab models, and they are basically trying to predict how a medicine is going to react to a particular disease. Uh, like the major aim behind this is to save like lots of animals which are on which the medicines are being tested. So they are, they are using deep learning models and all these things, but they have not mastered that and they have released few papers but it is still under the research it is still under research project and as far as what is being used as a machine learning and as far as I know they are similar statistical models uh, which are used to identify the data uh, Python science. Yeah, that's good. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? comments we uh by jesse or vene Some chat message here. Uh, very nice presentation of questions as of now. That was Vinay. Okay. Um, so I think. Uh, I will share some research work which is being done in Google AI with in the presentation. I will provide the links for that. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, yeah, I can send them out, um, you know, in a separate email. So uh, uh, if no one has any other questions, um, I don't really have anything else planned for the rest of the meeting. Uh, I do have some, some people uh, expressed interest in presenting in future meetings. So we've gone through a couple of presentations already and um, they've been pretty good. I mean, just I wanna get, have a pretty broad, um, meeting, you know, a uh, variety of things for people to uh, experience and maybe build off of a little bit. I mean, it doesn't have to be every topic, but I want to get some ideas flowing here. Um, so is anyone interested in presenting in the next couple weeks? Yeah, there's a schedule. I can send you a link to the schedule. Um, but basically, it's more or less open. Um, I know Jesse said was interested in presenting, and so we're having a little bit of trouble finding a time to present. 
Um, is that something you could do in this meeting, Jesse, or is that something we'd have to do offline? Okay, yeah, we'll pre-record. We could do that, yeah. So why don't we try to plan on doing that in the next two weeks? Um, I don't know what your, uh, yeah. So I mean, we've you know we we've kind of talked about this a couple times, and it's kind of gotten pushed back. But I guess we can like plan to do it if we plan to do it to a deadline. Um, then we can maybe do it a little bit. You know, we can actually get it out. Now you sent me a paper, you actually put a paper in the Open Worm Slack channel. Uh, it was, I uh, can't remember what it was. Do you have that paper? Can you provide a link to it? I can't remember the topic offhand. Yes, the Friston one. Yeah, his latest paper. I'm not really sure if... I think they'll probably be pretty suitable for the group. Uh, it's a little bit off the topics we've been talking about, but natural gradients for natural something. Yeah, I'm pulling it up on Slack right now. Let me get it. Uh, I just wanted to refresh my memory on it. But I think that would be a, an interesting topic for the group. Uh, definitely a good experience for you to go through the paper. Um, so... Well, I think we could just do the Friston paper. Um, that would probably be all right. And it's just like, you know, to get some practice in presenting and, uh, you know, maybe come up with a topic that we don't usually think about. So, uh, yeah, it was the topic. Um, yeah. Articles of interest. Yeah, natural selection finds natural gradients. And, um, yeah, so the first in the stuff on uh, free, the free energy principle is, is basically the... So Carl Friston is a, he's a neuroimaging, uh, big name in neuroimaging. And he does a lot of different types of research in that area. But he also has this thing called the free energy principle. And it's very similar to if people are familiar with a lot of the complex systems uh, work uh, in the past, uh, uh, the uh, dissipative structures work that was like years and years ago. Uh, that's basically what it is. It's about energy and, and its role in cognition in the brain. Um, one of our collaborators uh, recently put out a paper on this topic, uh, George Milhayovsky. And I didn't bring the paper with me into the meeting, but hes uh, it's a new paper of his that I'm reading through. I might present on that one, actually, at some point. Yeah, I'll send you a copy. Or, I'll, yeah, I'll send out that paper. Um, so, yeah, that would be a good topic, I think, to talk about a bit. Um, we don't really... Yeah, I mean, it's it's... We... The, the paper that I was involved with, with uh, Rob Stone, the one on uh, origins of the embryo, uh, George wrote a section on that. And that was, it's basically this, a similar thing that he talks about in this paper, this new paper. So uh, we can talk about that some, maybe one meeting. Um, otherwise, I think we're, how are we on our... Um, do we have any uh, projects that are open, any papers that we need to be working on? Any? I know we had uh, things kind of developed from last year. Uh, we had the uh, – Vinay had a blog post that he had proposed a, long t a while back. I think it was around the holidays, so maybe it got lost in the shuffle. Okay. So – Jesse has a question here, and and Vinay, you can answer me when you, when you want. But let's see. Jesse had another question here. 
I was going to ask more sometime about what was mentioned at the start of the year about working on a Docker project. Well, I guess the Docker thing is open. Um, so the Docker issue was, uh, so OpenWorm has created this, what they call a Docker file. And that's like a, it's a, it's a package that, or a, a container that you can run a bunch of programs in. It's kind of like a virtual machine. So you set it up on your machine and it replicates everything. You know, you don't have to worry about compatibility. You can run all these programs within that container. And the programs in there are different OpenWorm demos. And so they have different demos for, uh, like, you know, uh, electrical activity for uh, cell type. But they don't have anything for development. And so the idea was to create a simulation or some application that shows development in some way. And so, Jesse, the the sort of the goal there is to come up with an idea maybe for a simulation or something. Um, I had mentioned like a 3D simulation, but there might be a better idea out there. And so, you know, we've really been, I've been really been stuck thinking about that. How we, might we contribute to that? And so if any of you have any idea about what we might do for that, it would have to be something that would be relatively easy to implement. Um, and then it would just be implemented in that container and it would be included in the new version. And it would be, you know, something along the lines of a C. elegans developmental application. You know, it could be a simulation of cells dividing. It could be, uh, you know, something else. It, it, uh, I mean, there are different options to that. So, um, so if you want to keep thinking about that, Jesse, that's great. If anyone else has any ideas, let me know. Um, Devanch says, I think it would be great if we could have a short list. Oops. Let me read this message. I think it would be great if we could have a short list of major tasks remaining. Yes, I think that would be good. Or maybe just like a, we could set up like a, you know, some sort of thing on GitHub where we, you know, people can join in uh, different milestones or tasks and then we can follow up in the meetings. Um, I didn't really put that together yet, but we can. So the Docker simulation blog posts are pre-trained models. Yeah. And then it would be easy for all collaborators to read them and then take up or discuss. Yeah. So we had something like that. I haven't updated it in a while, but I'll probably just reorganize uh, it. We have a, we have a, a, a GitHub, um, project board for the for the general project but i haven't updated it in a while so it might be good to do dick says a list of potential papers might help organize things yeah so we could create a list of potential papers um and this might be just a uh, like a regular um, excel file where we have like the different things listed um, so that would be good too. We can put those together. Um, and then, okay, sure. I'll try coming up with some ideas about the visualization. So yeah, well, well, the visualization, we'll think about that. Maybe we'll revisit that next meeting and I'll create these different, um, different organizational things and we'll look through them. So, yeah, I think that'll work. And then maybe we'll have some uh, follow-up. Maybe, we, you know, this is the way to, to proceed on things. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And so, actually, Ujwal, you had, you had mentioned uh, something about the um, CompuCell 3D platform and we talked a little bit about that on slack um did you have any follow-up on that i told you that there are demos out there that you can use to get ideas of how to use the platform uh, so i have seen the demos of uh, compu 3d and like i'm still not 
perfectly understand like how this is working i am working on it i am learning it and like i am not able to visualize like how we are going to use compute cells really the main uh, question mine is that like they have used that to create animation so are we going to use it uh, amroid and this is for amroid growth or something like that yeah that would be the idea so the idea is you can build a simulation to you know first of all i think the easiest way to do it would be some sort of like cell uh cell division model where you have like go from a single cell to multiple cells and then it would just create this embryo that would be that we could then each cell could be specified and i think that in copy cell you know what you do is you build the 3d model and then you take each cell that exists and you specify it with some you know properties so the idea would be to create the model and it would just be like an empty model and then there'd be some cell division going on uh you know as a process but then those cells when they're born uh then they have specific properties and then well, once you build the yeah just build an embryo <laughs> You just build, yeah, you just build a single cell and it divides and you just uh, set that sort of thing up, but it's empty. Everything's empty. And then each cell then can be specified because you have like, you have a mother cell and you have two daughter cells and then you have two daughter cells and that just can, that process continues. And I think that's, uh, that can be set up. I know they've done like uh, s similar animations in copy cell i'm not really sure how difficult it is to get the, the you know to get the cell division process going but um i know they've done like complex organs so the idea of having like different types of cells or or you know different classes of cells is, is definitely something that exists in that platform and then you can attach data so you can attach information about the cell identity uh gene expression so in openworm right now we have models that have each cell in the c elegans and this they're the terminally differentiated adult cells and each one of those cells we've attached a lot of information to so you know you can go into uh we have a 3d model of the adult where you can go in and look at the each cell in the actually each neuron in the adult and highlight it and then there's you know like this animation of the neuron with its processes and then it tells you about that neuron a little bit it gives it an identity and then it gives it some data that's attached to it and um you know that and then you know we can work from there but the 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 first step would just to be to get like an empty model that you know it's just cells and dividing cells that create this mass of cells an embryo and then we can work on it from there figure out how to populate the model as it were oh, okay so like i have got some idea like what we have to do so like i will discuss it with you over slack uh, once i fully understand like how to use compassion 3d for our purpose uh, i will keep, keep in touch with you like on slack okay yeah, I mean, don't be afraid to play around with it. I mean, you know, it's just like to see what it can do. And like there's a, I, I don't exactly know the best way to do it, but if that's how we, we figure that out is by, you know, kind of doing like, you know, a smaller demo that can be scaled up. So you just like start with something really simple. Um, maybe just like a, showing a couple of rounds of cell division and then showing how to, you know, it can be done and then maybe scale it up from there. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, sure, sir. Like, I will start uh, doing small projects on it, and then we will see how can we proceed it further. Okay. That sounds good. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, we'll just, you know, talk later about that. Um, Let's see. What else do we have in the chat? Oh, that was the comment from Dick. I just, I like just build an embryo. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, well, it probably is a little hard, a lot harder than that. But <laughs> uh, Dick, did you have any ideas about uh, what you'd like to do or what your goals are for the next year or so? I mean, like in terms of what you've got going on in your different collaborations. Catch up. Okay, Basilaria Psychology and Axolotl Montage. So yes, we have the Axolotl data, which uh, I haven't gotten that yet. I will, when I get the data, I'll, we'll talk about that a bit more. But again, like if you guys remember back a couple of uh, sessions ago, we had a talk by Susan on the the axolotl embryos, the, the type of imaging data that they've collected. And we're trying to figure out a way to visualize that in a way that's, uh, that can be navigable, you know, like it's, you know, maybe some sort of something like maybe Google Maps or something where, you know, you can put the data together and visualize it. So you can explore it as a user. And we don't, I mean, I don't know what the best way to do that is necessarily, um, but I, you know, take a look at what the data look like and see if there's something that uh, is, is suitable, more or less suitable. Uh, there was a project that we, we t briefly discussed a couple years ago about um, where we took seashells and we wanted to acquire images of the patterns. So, you know, you'd put it on like a, ro uh, like a rotating table and you turn it at like maybe 10 degrees at a time and take a picture of the surface and then take all those images and spread them out. It's so kind of like a 3D pan or a 360 degree panorama view where you take all the images from around the edges of the, uh, of the seashell and then you spread them out on a flat surface. So there's some deformation, but there are defor deformation algorithms you can use to smooth everything out. And so then you could analyze the pattern in two dimensions to see if, you know, there's something that we don't know about because we typically look at these things on a curve and there might be some process going on. It could be morphogenesis. It could be something about the pattern itself, but to be able to analyze it. Dick says, if shell is trimmed as it rotates, could go down to its start. Yeah, so you could actually, like, sort the information by time. Uh, just looking at how the thing is, you know, it goes from one end to the other, because you can look at the sort of the deposition pattern of the shell, how the shell was put in place. Uh, so there are a lot of things you can do with those data. Now, with the embryos, you, you know, that's not really the same thing. It's, you know, they're... In, in axolotl embryos, they're basically transparent, or they're very easy to see. So, oh, is there a data set available? We, we don't have a data set for the, for the uh, seashells. We're getting the data for axolotl. Uh, Susan's sending it to me in the mail. So I'm going to get, I'm going to open it up uh, soon. And then, you know, we can talk about how to, you know, deal put, you know, do some analyses on the data, but, um, it's, yeah, it's, I don't know if it's available yet. Um, but yeah, I mean, so with the, with the embryo, it's not quite the same thing as a seashell, but you can like examine the features from across the surface of the, of the axolotl embryo and get a sense, sort of a spatial sense of what's going on in the embryo. Um, so it, you know, it'll be interesting to see what we can do with that. Um, and then also we have, oh, okay, Devonch says, okay, I was asking about the seashells. We'll try to find if there's any, this is something they think that was going to be acquired, but never quite got to the stage of getting it collected. Cone shells are cheap to buy, just need to rotate and photograph. 
So yeah, Dick actually uh, in the summers he goes or in the winters he goes to uh, generally speaking, not this year, but he goes down to Florida and he collect. He was collecting seashells one year. And he wanted to see if you could put them on a, rota a rotating table, which is just basically like, a, you know, a compass and a something you can uh, some, attach the sh seashell to and just rotate it by hand or by a machine. But something you can tell what the rotational angle is and then just move it around. So it wouldn't be that hard to produce the data. I mean, you could get seashells, you could buy them online or collect them and then put them on this rotational thing. Cone shells are cheap to buy. Patterns are presumed to be generated similar to Wolfram patterns. This idea has never been tested against real shells. So what Dick means by Wolfram patterns there is that uh, Stephen Wolfram wrote a book on um, cellular automata called A New Kind of Science. And I, maybe some of you are aware of this book, maybe not. It's about 20 years old. He spent like 10 years writing this book and exploring solar automata, which are a model of, uh, you know, it's a simulation model where you have cells and they interact with each other over space and over time, and they produce these patterns. And they, 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 basically each cell has a r interaction rule with its neighbor, and the interaction rules add up to these patterns. So you can implement different rules for the entirety of the automata surface cells will implement this pattern time after time and end up with these with these patterns they're usually like you know like triangles with a lot of triangles nested in them or like maybe stripes you know those sorts of things are generated not by some master plan but just by local rules being amplified across the surface and i think jesse would find that really interesting uh looking at uh, that book, or maybe it's just some of the ideas of Wolfram's uh, rules for cellular automata. He generated about 200 rules uh, in this book. It's, you know, it's quite extraordinary. And then the idea is that these cellular automata represent things in nature so that they're equivalent to natural processes like morphogenesis or like, um, you know, traffic patterns in a city or um, you know, a whole host of things in nature that you can link to these models. It's not just like a, um, and they're universal. So, you know, you might have like one set of rules that will model many different things in nature. That's the assumption. This is the citation for the book, A New Kind of Science. Yeah, I, did, I don't know. Reading the whole book, it's kind of like reading, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's huge. So, yeah, I wouldn't. But yeah, they, they do. Um, yeah, this is uh, this is also connects to something we were talking about with uh, in my other group with Breitenberg vehicles and like how Breitenberg vehicles aren't really like they don't have a lot of representation in them. And I don't want to get in too much about that conversation, but we can talk about it offline if you're interested. But that Breitenberg vehicles themselves don't have a lot of representation, but you know, they're, we don't really know how much representation they have. You can add representation maybe into a vehicle, and uh, it might uh, generate much richer behaviors. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's an inter maybe an interesting thing to follow up on, Jesse. If you, uh, you know, and just a matter, I think the book is mostly online. There's a lot of it that's online that you can just, like, look at and... Um, get a good sense of what's going on. Um, so the other thing that Dick mentioned here, let's see, I wanted to get back to before we end our meeting, is, uh, so list of potential papers. We had, uh, something about, oh, oh, the Basilaria Psychology. Yeah, so that paper, it's still being planned, uh, I haven't gotten around to outlining it yet, um, but the idea is that we have the Basilaria um, an analysis where we've looked at these organisms, these, these colonies of cells, 
and they move around in their space in the water and they generate a lot of movement patterns you know oscillations and things like that and so then the question is is, it, is there some sort of information processing or behavior that's going on that we can analyze or you know uh, make a connection i don't know about psychology but it's like uh you know they don't have brains but they generate behavior so is there some sort of like brain like thing going on in their morphology are they generating intentional behavior things like that and so that's going to be an interesting topic to revisit um I'm going to try to put a outline together for that. I mean, that's going to be something that we probably have to take a couple of stabs at. I talked a little bit about this to um, Thomas, who's doing a lot of uh, data generation, generating movies of Basel area. And uh, we'll see, you know, maybe he has, we already have some movies. Maybe he can generate more movies. And we can get those data, you know, uh, at least get them to a point where we can play with the analysis a little bit. So um, I don't I don't have a, a timeline for that, but I'll add it to the list of major tasks and potential papers that'll work. I think that should drive it forward a little bit more. So uh, any other questions? We're almost at the top of the hour. Okay. Okay. So Dick says, uh, ask Thomas to give a talk. Okay. I, yeah, I'll probably put him on the lineup. I'll ask him and see if he can give a talk on some of his. He's cultured a lot of Basilary already. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about that, give you an idea of what these organisms are, what they do, and, uh, you know, cell, or cell culture and organism culture is always fun to find out about because it's an interesting area in and of itself. So, okay, so yeah, uh, well, thanks for attending the meeting, and I'll send out a link with the information about the tasks and papers and maybe some information from Ujwal on his talk. And, um, well, thanks for attending and talk to you next week. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye.